Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of ARWP, the All Real Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, Eric Novak, and today we have a special guest. He is on a path. He is the machine. It is Brian Cage. And before I put that video up, I just want to thank each and every one of you for supporting me throughout this entire journey. And you're going to keep supporting me. I appreciate it. We are going to do great things. We are going to get bigger things happening. And I am in contact with AEW. So I might get more interviews coming up from their roster. We will see. I am not promising anything legally. But I will see you guys after the video. Thank you so much. And enjoy the video. And today we have a special guest. He is the machine. He is the Swolverine. He is on a path. Brian Cage. Hey, hell of an introduction. Look, <laughs> coincidentally, I have, a, I have a shirt that says machine too. I just, I just realized. So if you keep... There should be no reason for anyone to forget the nickname because it's right there. It's right there <laughs> on the promise shirt. All right. So let's get into the wrestling portion. Then we'll get to the hobbies. Tell me, if you can, in a memory, what your first match looked like, felt like. You know, how was it? How was it scheduled? My very first match? Very first match. Okay. So <laughs> here, I'll make this a long winded. Uh, sometimes my answers get pretty long winded. Um, so my very first match, I know it was shunned upon. I was just talking about this with like uh, a few of the guys at AEW actually um, about how like I feel like almost everyone, especially like around our age, was big into backyard wrestling, and uh, and it was like so shunned upon and like looked down. And then it was almost like once you like wrestled enough or got like you know in enough, you're like, oh yeah, yeah I did it too, I did it too. Um, so so my uh, my evolution of wrestling, if you will. So like first there was. First, there was like just you know like the rough housing and, and, and the house and stuff. Then we all started having like a uh, battle royals <laughs> out in this like little grass pit um, by where I lived. And all the neighborhood kids would get there, and you know it was always a shoot. And it was it was funny. It's just like the heels would do when you make make a pack with somebody. I'd always like make a pack with my younger brother because I knew together we could eliminate everybody, including my older brother. But then I knew full well that I had eliminated my younger brother, no problem. So that way I try to you know always always work it to get the win. Uh, from there. Uh, we started trying to have uh, some, uh, like, like, we were just, you know, in like, like, you're like, oh, I'm this, like, if your name, so my, my middle name, uh, my real middle name is Christopher. So I was usually Brian Christopher. A lot of people say I look like Benoit. So I was usually like Benoit or Brian Christopher. Uh, my, my brother's name, was, one of them was Justin, so we'd be jo Justin Hawk Bradshaw. That was his name. To give you an idea. So, like, we'd be that person, kind of do their moves. And that evolved to, like, actually, you know, having matches. And uh, the, I remember the first time we recorded a match, is because uh, my friend was going to break this this sheet of glass over my head. We have to record that. We can't miss that. And then once we recorded it and watched it, we're like, oh, my gosh. Why were we recording this the whole time? Now, we didn't do a bunch of hardcore stuff like it was popular then in that time with back at wrestling and the flaming tables and you know jumping off of everything. Uh, we always, our slogan was, it's not backyard wrestling. We just wrestle in a backyard. And it, it developed into um, – uh, an actual promotion I started running. So we got a ring and a business license and everything. And all the while I was training too um, at a local school um, close to me in Northern California up, up in Chico where I'm from, my hometown. And uh, so there's like, there's like the, the backyard wrestling matches and then to like the like, like semi-trained wrestling matches and then like my first like pro match, if you will. So there was some any matches when I was like more trained for a while, but like what I counted as like my first like pro match is uh, in July 2004 against one of my uh, my mentors and really good friends in some idolize and do a, a lot to homage his legacy was the, would be the late great Chris Canyon, which is also why I do the hoop better than Cage. If you know, so my gauntlets and Scott is I don't have my gauntlet on now, so I don't want to show you my wrist. <laughs> but my gauntlets, I, uh, I have a, a symbol on there. Um, I, I do a lot of his move set or variations of his move set, so. Um, sorry, I told you, long-winded response, but um, uh, that would be the first pro match that I counted in my pro career. And I remember even thinking, doing like the commentary on that match afterwards, that like to wrestle somebody that I realized like that and looked up to you, in my hometown nonetheless was like such an unbelievable feeling. And uh, I remember feeling like, oh, dude, I could like, my wrestling career could be over tomorrow after it just began and I would be like pretty okay with it. Like, I was so ecstatic. It was probably still one of the top three moments of my life. That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, that's great that you have that moment that 
sets it from all the other moments that you're like, I did this, so that proves all the hard work that I did managed to go to one path. All right, let's get to the second question. For me personally, I started watching wrestling with WWE, like I believe a lot of other people, but I got into sure. Lucha Underground, and that's where I first seen your work in Lucha Underground. You were phenomenal. I want to know how that call came, how the Lucha Underground called you, and then how the call came when they said they're done. They're not going to film anymore. Um, so I was uh, I was in developmental in FCW. I got released. When I got released, I came out here to L.A. I'll stay with my friend, good friend and former wrestler Brandon Bonham. And uh, while I was down here, um, I, uh, I got a random call that there was a AAA tryout. And I kind of didn't think it was real. And I guess it was, it was it was legit. So I went there, and I met Conan. He was running it. And I was really good with friends with Norman Smiley uh, in FCW. Why He was a trainer over there. Um, and Norman and Conan are tied from the days in Mexico together, um, as he would know him as Black Magic. And um, anyway, he put a good word in for me, and I went there, and I, I did a couple of different matches. They even stayed after to do a couple more matches for some people who were late to the uh, late to the crowd. And Conan was huge on me, was super high on me, really wanted me to bring me down. But uh, some stuff happened, and I know business was down in Mexico, and I think that's when there was a lot of, like, some shady stuff going on, cartel and drug stuff and whatnot, so it wasn't, like, the best place to be. Um, and this was, like, 2000, late 2009, early 2010, somewhere around there. Um, and uh, he's like, oh, hey, don't worry, we're working on some stuff uh, for the future, do some stuff stateside. So first it became... It eventually became Lucha Underground years later. So it took like, you know, four years almost. But uh, I know they got caught up because the actual first play was involved in an MTV wrestling or uh, MTV2 wrestling show. Uh, the, what was it, like Lucha Libre USA or something yeah, like that? Lucha or, Libre USA. I don't remember the exact name. Yeah, yeah. So there, there was some big, um, like, legal battle with that. And uh, when they were trying to become, to uh, create Lucha Underground. And uh, long story short there, it just, it just really took a long time. So once Conan uh, messaged me, like, in, you know, maybe it was, like, April-ish of 2014, he's like, hey, we're finally clear for everything. We're finally, you know, I know it took a long time. Thanks for believing me. But, like, we're finally going to come in uh, to the U.S. market and, you know, do the show. Like, we want, we really want you to be part of it. And, you know, we're checking out this person, this person, this person. Is there anybody else you could recommend? And I actually got him and Dorian and Christopher DeJoseph and somebody else came with them. Um, on the production side to come watch a PWG show as well to try to get a bunch of talent in. And that was like in May, the end of May of 2014. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it sounded great. And actually, meanwhile, I had been getting uh, um, back and forth uh, emails from WWE about doing a trial. Um, I had already been signed there. Actually, I had gotten signed, released, re-signed. Uh, my contract rescinded from being re-signed then contacted to be on Tough Enough, then taken off the list um, to talking uh, to Johnny Ace when they were in Fresno, to being told, like, okay, they'll probably bring her back after WrestleMania that year, to never mind, we're no longer interested. So there's a lot of back and forth and uh, disappointment on then. And then once the kind of management changed around, these, these uh, enough people were, like, putting my name out there to them that they started reaching out to me and said, Hey, you know, there was a, there was a black spot by my name. I don't know in, in what, or in, in, in regard to what, but he goes, but you know what? Let's try to get you in here. Maybe we'll at least do a trial. And I was like, cool, cool. Sure. And like, all right, well, you know, like this September, let's do a trial. Oh, wait, never mind. In December. Oh, oh wait, no, never mind. In January. Oh, and so this went on this back and forth for quite a while. Meanwhile, they finally sent me one. And it was right when I was about to sign my, my deal for Lucha Underground, as well as uh, my deal for AAA. I was going to get. I was one of the few guys that was getting the bonus deal because of uh, because Conan was trying to bring me AAA the whole time. So I was going to do that. They sent me um, uh, finally sent me the dollar paperwork to fill out for the trial for WWE, and I told him yes. I was at an indie show. It was a Friday night and Saturday morning. And I thought about it, and I was like, you know what? And I called them up, and I was like. I actually had plans. I was actually I think it was going on a cruise that weekend, which I was going to cancel and change. But I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do this cruise. I think I'm gonna sign up with John Ground. I think I'm gonna just go Triple A. Like, I've I've been basically, you know, uh, all but begging WWE to get back there for years, and they pretty much have just been dangling the carrot in my face the whole time, and it's gotten me nowhere. Now finally, somebody else wants me, and whether they know it or not, I was like, you know what? Maybe I need to take 
um, take that and, you know, and see what, see what, see where that comes. So I, I called him up and I said, you know what? I know I said, yes, you guys sent me all the paperwork and all the travel stuff. But, um, after thinking about it, I, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I, I want to go, uh, see what else is out there. I got some other opportunities. I want to give them a try and, and see where that leads. And, uh, I'm not going to lie. That felt pretty good to be able to say, say no, essentially, because you're very rarely in the chance to be able to be on the offense against uh, the WWE. And uh, I, I even then didn't know what to expect from Lucha Underground. Um, I kind of thought it was going to be a WSX kind of thing where there was a lot of people in charge that didn't know anything about wrestling, and it would be kind of a cool, quick payday that would just kind of blow up and go nowhere, and I couldn't have been more wrong. It was so rad. I, I loved it so much. Um, I was in many of interviews quoted saying, I want to be wrestling my entire life. But it wasn't until I was signed by Lucha Underground that I felt that 10 years old, you know, I had, I had a vision of what it would feel like to be a pro wrestler. And it wasn't until Lucha Underground that I felt like what I thought it would feel like to be a pro wrestler. It was awesome. I, it was it was still probably, I mean, AEW, I've only been there a short amount of time, but it's been amazing. But like, still Lucha Underground was probably the most fun and just the, the, one of the greatest times I've had in wrestling, you know, led to me getting married and having a child as well. So... Uh, I can't say enough about the gender It was great, and I wish it was still around. Second part of your question, I told you I go long winded on these answers. I love Sorry. it. I'm loving uh, this. Uh, I'm a pretty detailed guy. A lot of my essays that I write in school get really detailed. <laughs> uh, uh, so season four, it we were all kind of aware that like oh, this was looking like it just took too long to get to it, and then there's less episodes, and they were shooting it fast, and there's a lot of like pay raises and stuff that was supposed to happen that didn't. And you can tell that they're working on um, uh, a smaller staff, you know, like, like outside of the wrestlers. And, and there's just a lot of stuff. And you can just tell, like, mm, things probably weren't looking too good. And MGM wanted to buy it out. And I know um, – L- so Lucha Underground had, like, MGM producing it. The LLC that actually owned the remote copyrights to it. El Rey that owned the um, TV rights to it. And then and, um, I know Dorian from AAA – had a, had his hand in it too. So like there might have been more than that. Okay, just for that, say there's four owners. So MGM wanted to buy everyone out and just have it solely their show. So it would be fully funded, fully profited, put on their network, to, you know, just completely their show. And nobody else wanted to sell it because LLC wanted to make all their money back on it. Triple A didn't want to let go of it. It was El Rey's highest rated channel. Um, so, but yet uh, MGM kind of got left with like. Um, Without like getting too detailed to it, Barry, but like almost like almost like they got left with like all the costs of everything with little of the reward. Um, so with that being said, uh, it, it just started to kind of fall apart that season four, and a lot of people lost L Ray off of their uh, cable provider, so the ratings didn't do that well. And it just, it, it, I mean, even though it was still fun, season four was far and away uh, from seasons one through three, like just as far as everyone, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, there's just a different feeling and vibe. And like I said, it was very rushed. It wasn't the same attitude, the same atmosphere. And um, once it kind of, you know, didn't do as well, then uh, everyone was kind of more willing to sell it. But MGM was like, no, we don't, we don't want it now. Like you guys, you know, kind of made the product like this and then go, oh, it started to dip down. So it kind of sat around forever. And then everybody was trying to fight to get out of their contracts and, you know, everybody wanted to get work elsewhere. And it just started to roller coaster and snowball downhill. Um, and you know, it, there was, it was never announced that it was done or that it wasn't going to film again. It just kind of unofficially, officially ended, if you will. So you never got an actual call saying, Hey, we're not coming back. No. All right. Cause I was talking to Matt Cross and he said the same thing. He never got a call that was on the ground, told him he's not coming back. All right. No. And I fucked out because I know impact made a deal with Blue on ground for some of their talent. And uh, I went back and forth, and that's when I would debut for Impact. And I was actually, uh, you know, I was filming season four while I was shooting Impact um, when I first got there. And then so, like, at least for me, as far as, you know, uh, televised work and stuff, we were also through the indies, of course. But uh, for televised work and stuff, I was a part of Impact. So them not coming back wasn't, like, affecting me, you know what I mean? But for certain other people, it was, because, like, they were, you know, looking forward to that, thinking of that paycheck, but also... They couldn't sign somewhere else because Luke Underground hadn't released their contracts or announced that they were done. And that was kind of like the F that part that a lot of people got upset about because you're basically holding people hostage, but 
they're not getting anything from you, you know, which is, you would think technically would be illegal. And like I said, that, that's why it became like a big kind of a headache for a lot of people. But, you know, you know, in the end, it all obviously all worked out and everybody got all the contracts and it all just kind of stopped. But yeah, there was never a, uh, an official like, hey, we're done. It's not coming back, you know, whatever. It just kind of just stopped. All right. That's, you know, strange because now not promotions would just not tell, you know, their own roster, hey, you're not coming in or anymore, you know? It's just a little bit of an inconvenience. Well, I think it was like super wishful thinking that somehow something would still eventually, you know, just would just pop up one day. I don't know. That's what Matt Cross but, said. Yeah. 20 years from now, he said it's going to pop right back up. Who knows? Right. I, we were talking about the other day, and I actually agree. I think it'd be cooler if uh, instead of like, coming back for another season, which I wanted there to be a season five so bad because I didn't want to stop. But if it was going to stop, I wanted there to be a season five, especially because of the cliffhanger of season four. I said season four was not good, but the cliffhanger in the the finale of season four was great. And I I wanted there to be season five so bad because I wanted there to at least be finality to it. You know what I mean? Like there's all this cool buildup. Like if there just could be closure and be an ending to everything, that would be great. Um, But instead of coming back to do a season, it would be cool if we came back and like did like almost like a movie, like just like a two hour quick movie. And I know that was uh, far fetched, but that was kind of the, the wishful thinking as well was like, they wanted to have this, you know, the, the seasons that would like develop into like individual movies, you know, whether they're theatrical releases or just, you know, TV or whatever. But, um, because of all the cinematics that they did and whatnot, and all like kind of the, uh, you know, superhero kind of, uh, abilities everyone had their own little backstory and stuff. So, um, it, it could have been real cool. It could have been real cool. Matter of fact, the um, my Alta Lucha, like kind of either, at the end, they was having a little highlight, you know, of everyone. And I've never been a part of it. I've always thought it was so cool. Mine, mine actually, season four, since I was off after Pentagon broke both my arms and uh, beat me in the last man or machine standing match. Um, their idea was to have me like in a factory, getting my arms rebuilt, like oh, uh, like I was Jack awesome. from combat. Like wow. I, so now I'm actually in the machine. But uh, and I was so jazzed on that, and then it never happened. So I was so bummed. Oh my god! There, there's always a story like that. There's an opportunity, and it just doesn't happen. It's crazy. Yeah. You know? Did you ever like? Did you watch cartoons as a kid, like superhero cartoons, stuff like that? Oh, absolutely. That's okay. what I am. What this reminds me of is like my favorite show of all time will be Teen Titans. Did you watch Teen Titans? Yes. Yes. It's like so, that. So I- I, I was I was older for Teen Titans, but yes, I watched it. It's it's like that, you know, like season six, we're all dying for. We're probably never going to get it, or we will 20 years from now. But it's like, it's the way Lucha Underground ended, the way Teen Titans ended, with like all cliffhangers. Well, you know, there is so many, right? There's so many TV shows, or, or more importantly, movies that get sequels, you know, like 35 years later. They're like, oh, hey, let's just make the sequel that we should have made in 88, but now we'll do it in 2018, like... Yeah, they did it recently with Samurai Jack. I don't know if you saw it. Samurai Jack ended yep. 2000, came back 2019 or 2018 around there. All right. That's all this new again, so. Who knows? All right. So we got through, you know, the Lucha Underground. We got through all that. Let's talk about Impact. You know, you had so many memorable moments, so many memorable rivalries. What was one of your favorites? What was one of your favorite dialogues, something that you just enjoyed to do, come out and the entire segments? Um. Well, okay, so... I think actually both in Lucha Underground and in Impact, my favorite feud was with Johnny Mundo, Johnny Impact, John Morrison, with the, the John guy, John Hennigan. <laughs> um, uh, I thought we had a really good one in Lucha Underground, but the one in Impact was fantastic, and it lasted. It went from us both being faced to him turning heel and, you know, ducking me. And, like, I just thought the whole story went so great with the ref and, like, all these, like, screw up kind of finishes and like it just it was really really well done and again it lasted for like six months or so <laughs> so it was a very long-winded storyline that was very great uh the only fail that was my big moment to end you know the, the big payoff and blow off to me finally beating him becoming the world champion you know finally in my career too was i got injured in that match and uh you know the whole match obviously changed on the fly and it, it went from being one of my uh most anticipated matches to probably one of my uh, my uh, least favorite as far as performance based, um, but no, that everything with that storyline though and that feud was was tremendous. All right, awesome. So I, you know, I, I can't say the they did really good work, really really good work with um, the feud with Sammy and I though as yeah, well, I especially about getting all that. Like, because too, 
I know they were trying not to have me work as much, even though I could then. They're just like, well, oh, better safe than sorry, you know, because they want me to do it. Because I, I came back, that's a mistake too. Like, I came back too soon, um, but knowing me, knowing I wasn't going to be ready, but I was like, no, F it. I want to fight at Slammiversary. I wanted to defend my title. This elegant, like I was supposed to. I already had several weeks off. Let's do this. I'll be okay. And uh, the match was awesome. That's still probably one of my favorite matches. Not because it was good, but people don't realize, like, how hurt I, you know, I still was and how painful it was. So to be able to have that match and perform at that level and like, like it was, it was very real to me, you know, the emotion involved. And, uh, and I didn't feel that bad, but then, yeah, it, when we tried to have that street fight, um, shortly afterwards, like I was just, too, I was still just too messed up and it just had, uh, it just lingered. So I can see why they were a little worried about anything happening and then maybe not being able to perform, you know, come bound for glory. So for us to have, such a good and like personal, like heated storyline with me and Sammy without really having us do that much or, or no matches or, you know, not, like they did a really, really good job. And that's why they involved Melissa. And it's, uh, uh, impact doesn't get enough credit, man. I know I'm not there now, but I, I have nothing bad to say about impact. Um, I think it's a great product and I know not a lot of people have eyes on it and it has a lot of already negative preconceived notions, but man, I'm telling you impact is, is a much better product than people give it credit for I agree. I love Impact. I watch it every Tuesday, and the talent they have, like the new talent, TJP, Chris Bay, always um, sick. Yeah, it's amazing. Crazy Steve, another one. You know, they always have new talent. All right. So, you know, I want to get through all the wrestling ones quick, so let's talk about gear. As, you know, a comic fan, to wrestling, it's all about gear. I think that's what it mainly is. Your gear is awesome. You got the whole black, white, and gold right now in AEW. You had the Weapon X gear. You had red and black. What's your favorite gear? And also, how do you design your gear? Is it you who does it? Is it, you know, a process? Okay, so my favorite gear, uh, it probably is the, the oh, let me have some good ones, but I, I really like the Wolverine one, the yellow and blue one, the co combination. Um, I know I started doing like the 50-50 split, like half, you know, one base, half the other base. I, I do like that gear. Um, I have somebody who designs my logos. Um, on Instagram is uh, John Awesome, the real John Awesome. He's, he's made a lot of shirts for me. He's made like almost all of my gear designs, uh, does some really good stuff. And then the guy that actually makes my gear, I always joke about this. So it's actually an Helico's guy from Mexico. Mm -hmm. I don't know his name. <laughs> never met him. Never talked to him. It's almost like a drug deal. So I'll like, I'll be like, I'll talk to John. Hey, he's got this awesome design. But oh, cool. I'll send it to an Helico, and I'll be like, yo, you know, maybe this color, and this color, or this, you know you know, this 50-50 and this 50-50 or whatever it is, okay, then he'll let him know, Then and Helco will message you back a price, and then I'll PayPal it to somebody, and then, you know, three weeks later at such and such show or whatever, somebody from Mexico will come with, with my gear in a plastic bag, and that's how I get it. So it's totally like, it's like a drag, mm -hmm. like it's like, I don't know. But if it's perfect, it's great, and it's, it's, it's been awesome. So that's, that's who makes my gear every time. And I know once I found out I was going to be paired with Taz, I was like, oh, I should have got black and orange gear, but I had actually already, uh, I'd bought, I, I'd redone a couple older sets of gear and then I did a few new sets of gear, but it all been stuck in Mexico because the whole pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody's wrestling, nobody's traveling. And then I had it, I had it mailed in so I could have new gear to wear or to wear at my debut. Um, I asked some other stuff to come to you, but now that I'm with Taz, like, well, sh I gotta get some black and orange made. Of course. I gotta ask. Cause like I said, I love gear. Can you give us some kind of sneak peek or any idea of what you might wear for fighter fest? Um, you know what? To be perfectly honest, I don't even know. But I, I didn't. I didn't even know the date until last night because <laughs> we weren't sure. There's a couple of different variables of when it was going to happen and why it would happen, and we weren't sure until last night on TV when everybody saw. That's when I saw it too. <laughs> so I only just found out it was going to be that week. So we'll see. I, I uh, I'm not sure yet. All right. So we got to talk about it because it's one of the biggest promotions right now. You signed with All Elite Wrestling. Can you tell us how that came? Can you tell us? You know, I know you were injured at the time, and I know many contracts were given to you. Tell us why you picked All Elite Wrestling. Tell us, you know, how the process happened. All right, I've said this a few different times, just to like get it clear. No, when I when I said I wasn't signed to All Elite Wrestling, it started Melissa on Twitter. That was absolutely true. Everything's were lying or fabi that, and and I, I'll tell you why. I was super upset because. I was still under impact contract. Not only did I did I want to an AWS, was I did I knew offers were coming for everyone. I talked to some people, yes. But I had officially not gotten any offer, any contract, nor had signed anything. I'll tell you why. Um, it'd be breach of contract. 
So legally, I wouldn't be able to. So had I, Impact would have all its rights to like basically, you know, put a hold on it and and create a, an issue for me if he wanted to. So when that came out, I, I literally walked through the curtain for my RVD match. I had my torn bicep that surgery on. My lips split in half, hanging off, bleeding all the place. Everybody's looking at me funny. I'm like, what's going on? Everyone's phone's blown up. And I look at my phone and it says, I understand. I'm like, well, not, not A, is it false? B, now if I do, like, it's taking away the surprise, you know, for me to be able to say that. I'm like, but see, now I'm like, oh, great. I'm going to get in trouble now. And uh, so, like, yeah. And I was like, and it's not true. And it was really kind of awkward backstage. Um, and except and I, I loved Impact. I have nothing bad to say about it. Now I'm like, you know, I got to go to the hospital, get my lip stitch. I got to need surgery on my arm. Um, and then I'm saying farewell, rushing out the door to go to the hospital. Why everybody thinks like I'm like, you know, freaking signed another company at the same time. So it just wasn't the best farewell. And I was a little upset by that. Um, but yeah, I was, I was really mad about it. So when I told everybody I didn't sign, it wasn't because I was trying to kayfabe it. So I could be surprised. I really hadn't signed anything. Um, I talked to everybody, um, that week. And I know AEW had offered me a deal later that week. Um, and then I told, they were on the cruise and I told Tony like, Hey, my arm is messed up. I don't think I'm going to have to have surgery though. Um, I, I talked to a couple doctors. They looked at it from their examination. You don't think it's fully torn where I'd have to have surgery, but I got an MRI anyways. I said, I have the results any time. I'll let you know. Literally the next day after emailing them that I got the results and said, it's fully torn, have to have surgery. I was like, you're kidding me. And with surgery too, you have to have that within three weeks or less actually, like, like 20 days. 19 to 20 days, do you prefer, at the most, because uh, what happens is your tendon rips off, rips off the bone, and then it rolls up into your arm, and if you don't pull it back down and, and reattach it, it'll scar down where basically you can't without destroying the bicep to move it back down. Um, anyway, so I told him that, and uh, I thought for sure, just like what happened with WWE, I thought my contract was going to get rescinded. I thought it was going to be, you know, SOL, and just on my ass at home for who knows how long trying to rehab my bicep. Like, so I'm, I'm in panic mode. I'm like, no. And then, uh, Tony's like, Hey, don't worry. We'll talk. You know, we're back off the cruise. Don't worry. Everything will be fine. So I'm like, I'm not, you know, guaranteed anything. It, it gave me a little peace of mind, but I still wasn't sure. And then mm -hmm. when they came back from the cruise and we talked, uh, yeah, no, they were cool. Like, Hey, don't worry. We believe in you. We have faith in you. We want you to part of the team. We know what you have to offer. Like we'll still sign you. Like you're, you're fine. Don't worry about it. So, that was awesome. And right then and there to prove to me that it was a, a good move on, on my behalf. And I chose the right, um, the right company to sign with. Now, is that saying that anyone else wouldn't have done the same thing? I mean, it's possible, I guess I, you know, I, I feel like if impact wanted me, we probably would have kept the whole time too. Uh, even though knowing I was injured, especially because I was injured while being under their contract. But, um, uh, I, I'm just saying AEW obviously didn't have to, or didn't need to do that whatsoever. And the fact that they did just, says a lot about them. Um, so that's how it happened. And then, uh, you know, I just busted my butt. And whether I was going to be ready or not, I wanted to debut sooner. Obviously, the pandemic happened and put a hold on a lot of stuff, made a lot of changes. And they were just like, hey, let's just, you know, let's just try to make it happen for double or nothing. So that was the plan. And uh, I told them that that should for sure be able to happen. And I had no idea what we were doing or, you know, anything with Taz or ladder match or anything until, like, probably the week before. <laughs> That's always exciting, isn't it? When you get to know things last yeah. minute, it gets makes you open up. Um, I do want to bring this up because, you know, not a lot of people have that position, but you got really lucky in the way where you got injured at the time of the pandemic where you got to spend a lot more time with your family. You know, you don't have to go flying to tapings and, and doing other things like that. So it's really fortunate that you got to spend time with your daughter, you know, your wife and everything like that, you know? Well, yeah, because, you know, I... I Normally, a lot of people were doing a lot of indie work, and this is like obviously wrestling totally, as in the rest of the world, totally slowed down. And everything came to a pretty close to a standstill, and so yeah, it, it made it um, opportunistic for me because it wasn't like I was missing out on much because nothing was really happening, you know. So in that regard, I lucked out. It wasn't like everything passed me by; it all kind of started to slow down. So it uh, it wasn't like I was, you know. I wasn't gone for any of the main parts of the movie. I, you know, I went to the bathroom exactly. during, during a whatever spot. So it worked out all well, uh, all right for me. All right. So tell us, you know, because you said you only found out a week before. Tell us uh, your reaction. Tell us how you felt because a ladder match, you know, that was, you know, a pretty interesting match, you know, to get a chip. You know, tell me how all that came. Tell me how you prepared for something like that, you know? 
Well, first thought was like, what the hell? I've been out for X amount of months with injury. My first match back is a ladder <laughs> match. I was like, hold on, hold the hold on. Um, and then I then I saw it was like the, the the casino ladder match rules. And I assumed, of course, I was probably gonna be the last one because um, I also assumed that I was gonna be unannounced. Again, I didn't know that either until they showed that. Um, so I was like, okay, well, that's probably gonna be uh, me, and I'll be the last guy. So that would guard like, okay, well, you know, I probably won't won't be uh, uh, you know taking anything like super crazy or whatever because I'm not gonna be at the match the whole time. But uh, again, I didn't know anything. Uh, I was just trying to be in the best shape and I guess as ready as I could be to be able to uh, to debut. And I was ecstatic. I was way more excited than I thought I would be with no crowd. I mean, I was still gonna be excited, but I thought I was gonna be really like let down and off. But I was super nervous, super excited. Um, you know, it was a surprise debut, brand new company, on pay per view, first match from injury. So there's a lot of things going through my mind and and uh, in my body. And I was I was ecstatic, man. It was it turned out really really well. Uh, we came with some real creative uh, spots and some real cool things we did. And actually, I didn't even I didn't even expect or think I was winning like like until uh, like maybe the like 20 hours before the match or something like Wait, that. Like seriously? it was like really late, like time before I found out that I, that I was winning. So I was like, Oh shoot. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. Well, I mean, I got to ask, cause you know, all this is just happening now, you know, you've made a lot of comments, you know, back when you were signed with impact or, you know, just AFK, you know, you were with, wanted to face Kenny Omega. You want to face other people. Now you have a whole roster of AEW. Who are just three that you want to face really badly that, like, if I'm watching TV and I see Brian Cage versus this guy, I'm going to be, like, always excited for this match. Who are three guys that you well, put? That, that was that was a big reason, too, why I signed with AEW, because I felt like I had the most amount of uh, good, not only, like, awesome matches, but first-time ever matches. Um, and with, you know, more creative control, obviously. Um, yeah, uh, number one will be the Kenny Omega, because I don't know, I love Dwarf Kitty. I think the fans may want to see that happen more than uh, maybe either one of us want that match to happen. Uh, we that match has to wait for those fans though. We can't have we can't we can't be out there without the, the dueling terminator claps. That that has to happen with with the crowd. Um, outside of that, man, oh, there's so many people, and I I always have to think of like who I want to wrestle or like you know, this match would be great or that match would be great, and then I go, oh wait, this guy's here too. Oh, sure, I forgot about that guy. So to name just top three, man, I don't know. I mean, for sure. Kenny Omega, definitely uh, Chris Jericho because um, I mentioned Chris Canyon earlier, but the three wrestlers I tried to emulate myself after uh, was like a hybrid version of Chris Benoit, Chris Jericho, and Chris Canyon, the three Chris's. So uh, the fact that uh, I've got to work Chris, you know, obviously Benoit, he's been long gone, but Jericho's still around and he's still killing it, man. So to be able to get to work Chris, that would be awesome. Um, and then lastly, oh, man. Um, it's a hard one too. There's you know, a bunch of great athletic Haas guys, and everybody wants to see. You know, I'm already I'm already lined up to work with Mox. Um, trying to think of something maybe you know, Pac. 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 Pac would be great. Yeah, 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 that'd be great. That'd be a really good one, I'm sure. All right, awesome. See, now I'll know when I see those matches announced. I'll be like, Cage is excited. I'm gonna be excited. The whole world's gonna be excited. All right. Tell us how, you know, you said it again, you, you got the idea, you know, a week ago, but you and Taz, tell me how you feel, because you don't really, you don't really have a manager, you know, Melissa was always, you know, doing commentary for Impact, she was never really, other than, like, independent events, she was never really a manager, so now you have an actual manager doing your vocal, your everything, how does that work, how do you feel about that? Yeah, that was a first for me, too, but no, that was cool, man, um, and you know, it's funny, uh, a lot of people praise Taz on the mic, and a lot of people... At the same time, like didn't even even though he's a really good commentator, um, I kind of almost forgot or, or never really realized how good he is on the mic as far as promo work. And uh, I'll be honest, myself included, I was like, like I wasn't worried. Oh, is he bad? Is he good? Like I knew that he could talk, and then I just kind of realized, like, oh crap, man, he's got a lot of really good promos. And I feel like I don't know how, but I feel like that he never really got much uh, uh, like recognition or like like when we hear Taz, the first thing I think about is his, his promos. You know, when you think. Him walking out the towel on his head, suplexing people on their heads, and then Taz mission. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, I was like, oh yeah, man, he's a real good promo. Then obviously, we get the, the immediate comparison with Lesnar and Heyman, especially with Taz being ECW guy as well. Um, but uh, but no, I think I think it's worked out great. And you know, I've talked to him with a lot of stuff, and he's very 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 uh, 
and intrigued and excited to be part of this. He's, he really wants to be hands on with a lot of things in a good way, in a good way. Um, and uh, funny enough, too, when he called me, like when I found out about this, he called me, talked to me for quite a few hours, and he even said the um, they wanted him to be in a manager role, and he was open to it, and was interested, but he it depended on you know who he was managing. <laughs> And they said, okay, well, you know, if you had your choice, who would you want to manage? And he said, like, like the two main people he'd want to manage that came out was Jeff Cobb and myself. They're like, well, that's perfect because we were actually going to ask you if you'd be uh, open to manage Brian Cage. So that works out well. So that was cool, the fact that they wanted Taz to manage me on their own. And then Taz, uh, you know, I was one of the couple names that he, would, he if he was going to manage, he wanted to manage. So that worked out pretty well there. I mean, yeah, you know, you're going to be the – and I, I don't want to compare, but, like, Every wrestling has their units. You will be like Paul Heyman and Brock Lesnar of AEW. I can see it. You know, Archer, I don't want to say they did anything wrong because I think Cody definitely deserves a TNT championship for all that he's done. But I feel like if Archer beat Cody, that would have set as him being, you know, somewhat like the Brock Lesnar. But since he has shown a loss, and I'm not going to jinx anything, but I, I see what you're doing now. I see that you're unstoppable. So there's definitely an aspect of us comparing, you know, Brock Lesnar to you, to Paul Heyman, to Taz. I, I just I just do a lot more moves than Brock Lesnar, so... A lot more. <laughs> <laughs> you show no, up. You know, I, and, and I think, uh, you know, Lance Hoyt, he's been around forever, too. He's been for, like, every company he's on TV. But I feel like even with that, they've done a really good job of making Lance more of a monster-type character. Yeah. I don't think he ever really was anywhere else. And again, for someone who's pretty well-known and been everywhere, you know, from WWE to TNA to New Japan, you know, everywhere... Um, they did a really good job of, like, reinventing him. I feel like he's at his, like, you know, coolest point with what they're doing with him, for sure. Yeah, I'm loving I think, everything. I think that that's a big thing to, to him being with Jake Jake as well, so. No, yeah, I'm, I'm loving absolutely everything AW is putting out. Everything is amazing. All right, I want to know this because, you know, this is one of the most unique things anyone any wrestler has ever done. You wrestled on a cruise. You know, you had a match. Tell me how that was. Tell me that experience. Tell me the trip. I need to know that information. Well, I, I, I absolutely love cruises. Cruises are like one of my favorite thing. I even said I was going on a cruise when, <laughs> when WWE, WWE was trying to get me to go to uh, uh, the, the tryout deal. Um, I've been on several cruises. I love them, especially because of, uh, of just never never needing that food. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fat kid at heart, and uh, – uh, I, I love it. I love it. Just I, I've never had a bad time on a cruise. I love them all. Some people don't like them, and it boggles my mind. So then you throw in the fact that there's wrestling on a cruise. Not only us being able to wrestle, but like all because all of us are on heart are still fans. You know what I mean? So here we are on this cruise, and there's you know this person's podcast, and there's this person's you know comedy thing, and there's this person's you know sit down interview or storytelling of Mick Foley or you know freaking the pods. Like there was just so much to do. Not to mention the excursions. And, like, it was great. It was fantastic. And a lot of people thought it'd be a little too nuts, like, to uh, to be around, you know, on, tra- trapped on a boat with a bunch of fans. Mm-hmm. And, like, it was like, it wasn't like that at all. And everybody was super cool. It, it was great, man. It was great. I loved it. And uh, I actually tried to politic to get on the second one. Um, and I was trying to get my, uh, I was, like, ready to debut, like, you know, like, five days later. I was like, oh, what if I just debuted on, on the cruise? That'd be amazing. So, uh, I mentioned that, but it was it was you know it was right before it was going to happen. So the whole thing was two, two booked and two sold out, and it wasn't going to happen. Plus, there was the the, the issue that I had with the whole uh, torn bicep wasn't really going to work out for me either. But uh, uh, it, it's probably best that it didn't, even if I was completely healed and I was able to in this room because uh, I just was trying to get on the, the cruise because it would be a blast. But obviously, like. Me not being with AEW and then being on the cruise is kind of probably did give away that I'm going to be like on the show. So they're trying to like, surprise debut me, but then here's Brian Cage walking around on the cruise for a few days. Most people could probably put that together. So uh, it probably worked out well that I was on the cruise, but uh, as long as everything shapens up, there should be no reason why I won't be on the next one. So All right. No, that's awesome. I cannot wait to see you that. Know, you know, I, I didn't even answer your question. I just want to hold off about the cruise. But yes, wrestling, wrestling on the cruise, the actual wrestling – was awesome. It was great to be able to do. And uh, funny enough, like, yeah, you can't tell that you're on a cruise when you're wrestling. Like, it, it didn't feel like anything. Um, and it was a super cool match. It was, uh, you know, it was Impact versus the Bull Club then. So it was like Impact versus ROH. So it was kind of a unique uh, crossover match that you don't get anywhere. Um, so it was, it was great to be able to be part of that. It was a lot of fun. 
Awesome. You know, it's watching it, you know, seeing, you know, footage of it was just remarkable. You know, you were in a whole tag team against the elite. I believe they were in Halloween costumes. I believe they were just as Mario characters, which had to yeah, make yeah, it place on Halloween, yeah. Which had to make it, you know, more and more spectacular. But you know, like you, you, you answered my next question, which has been how like the fans reacted. You know, fans probably looked at you and probably kept on staring, waiting, you know, trying to say hi, probably not, probably afraid, and you're probably just out in the you know limbo deck, you know what I mean? <laughs> and like like and there was a good combination, but everybody was super chill. Like, so like the first day there and I was walking around too, we had we had a daughter on there and Melissa came with us and the first day there, you know, people were talking they're really cool and a lot of people started you know, not a lot, but people would ask for the autographs of the pictures and um they were respectful about it and nice. But even then we said, hey, hey, you know, like tomorrow morning we're doing like a meet and greet, you know, for a few hours. But also like, um, I was like, and then, you know, anytime anybody asked after that, I'd be cool with it. But I was like, we, we, we respectfully declined it. Everything was cool just because uh, we were like, hey, we just want to be, you know, on vacation too. As, as you know, we sat there, we talked to plenty of them. But like, as a guy, I don't want to take a picture because you're going to take a picture with you. Now I feel bad if I say no to the next person. You know what I mean? You're like more of a jerk for that. So like I tried just like, hey, zero tolerance. But I wasn't an asshole about it. And everybody was super cool. And yeah, the next morning, like I said, we were down there for hours taking pictures and autographs with everyone. And then any time after that, for what man, somebody said something like, it was super chill, super easy to go. We just wanted one night of, uh, you know, being able to be just like everyone else. Uh, but then, yeah, even outside of that, the whole four nights, like no one, it was never an issue. Nobody swarmed us. Nobody was inappropriate. Nobody was, it was very, very cool. Nothing, nothing bad to say. It was great. Awesome. All right. Um, no, yeah, because, you know, that's I've seen so much footage. I've seen how many people are literally on that cruise. And, you know, you are the most marketable, you know, face. You know, when they see someone, they're probably all staring. You're probably eating dinner. The entire cruise is probably just staring at you, the entire restaurant, you know. Yeah. It's it's really interesting. All right. No, I want to get I want to kind of start a little bit. I want, I want this to be part of the rivalry because I was a part of uh, the New York Comic Con panel. I don't know if you've seen it when Cody and Jericho had their feud. They did a whole thing in the panel. I was a part of it. That was amazing. I want to kind of get you know your story on the Moxie part because Moxie's already spoken. How do? What are you waiting for? What are you seeking uh, till Fighter Fest? What am I seeking until Fighter Fest? Like, what do you mean, before then? Like, what yeah, yeah, like, like, what's what's the schedule? Like, are you just going to be through going throwing, going through everybody until the day of... Uh, you know what? I don't know what's, uh... I don't know what's actually planned on, uh... What, on that, was it the 9th? 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th? 10th, the mm-hmm. next one? Um, I don't know what's what's planned, to be perfectly honest. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm here. I'm excited to be back, uh, back in the ring. Like, not only back as... And part of AEW, but you know, people have to realize I was I was wrestling super full time schedule between Impact and just you know three sometimes four any dates a week on top of that. Um, so I mean, if they want me to go out there and throw people around, I'll gladly go out there and throw people around. If they want me to go out there and work whoever on the main roster, I'll do it. Like I'm 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 a workhorse and I'm ready to get to work. So I've already been you know sitting on the sidelines far too long. Um, and the more uh, the more rust I can you know rub off before I, I, I face Moxley, the better. Um, I think there's already been great build up for it, um, which is funny because we haven't done a whole lot. And I think it's a match, even myself, you know, I wasn't expecting to have. I think a lot of people weren't expecting this match up the gate. And it's almost like the, uh, you know, you see a lot of Twitter like, oh, I never knew I, how bad I wanted Moxley versus Cage until now. And and it's great that we've been building it up uh, already this fast but without doing anything. And it makes sense. Like, when he's in the rain, he's cutting his promo, and we're face to face, like, there's no reason for me to punch him. Why would I punch him? It's not like he, you know, it's not like he slept with my wife. There's no, no animosity. He's a champion. So right now he's the best thing in AEW, right? I'm the new guy and I'm trying to show everyone that I'm, you know, to ask the question who's better than the cage. There's nobody better than cage. So I want to come after him. I already got the shot at the title and my debut. So I want to be where he's standing. I want to be the champion. That's it. That, that's, that's all the feud needs to be. You know what I mean? So there's no reason I need to jump in from behind, you know, or have a game mentality like, like Dark Order or whatever. Um, now, is that to say that things probably won't pick up before then? Oh, I'm sure they will. I'm sure ten- tempers and tension more will flare up. But uh, as of right now, I'm like where it's sitting, and yeah, I'll, I'll be out there on Wednesday, and whatever they want me to do, I'll, 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 I'll gladly do it. What do you have to say about you know him saying he's a different shark, he's a different breed, you know, he's got one style of wrestling, he's regular, you're a machine, you know, he sees that you are not a regular person. He sees that when he faces you, it's going to be a, a fight. What do you? What do you? 
that, that's go ahead, go ahead. And just how, how do you take all that? You know, how do you take all? Because he's he's in my opinion, I think he's given you know respect. You know, as a champion, he's saying you know you are what you say you are. I know what you are, and I'm champion. Yeah, you know, I, I do think it's funny too. He came out and kind of laughed, but then he kind of said like, "Oh yeah, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, I was giggling, or whatever." You know, because I'm excited. Like I'm excited to have this guy on the roster. I'm excited for the matchup. So that's like kind of the uh, the game sportsmanship, you know, mentality. Uh, that being said, I do appreciate him too. Say, so like, "Hey, you're right. I'm nobody else is." A, is like me on the roster. I, I set myself apart, and I feel like I've done that my entire career. So there's, you know, he's, he's recognizing that as well. And I will then agree with him that uh, I don't think I've faced anybody like Moxley before. And he's kind of, um, he's a little bit of a wild card, you know. And he's got a different style that I don't ever really worked with. And I've never, that was this past week's, you know, promo. We weren't necessarily face-to-face, but close to it. That's the closest I've ever been to Moxley before. Um and uh, he's weird too, because you know he's he's got some decent height on him, but it's always like in a weird flux of like he's not a big guy, but he's not a, definitely not a small guy by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, I don't know, I I I really really look forward to because this is definitely a match that um, I, uh, I I didn't foresee like I said happening, especially this fast like this. And so I I don't know really what to expect, but uh, if this is my first, you know big matchup, which I don't know that I'll have any big matches before this, that I'm ready to go out there and uh, for everyone who doesn't know me, prove exactly, you know, why I'm every, you know, the machine, the who better, the, the, the Rage Cage, owner of the spotlight, whatever moniker you want to give me to show everyone, okay, that there's a reason for that. And there's a reason why so many people are hyped. So if you didn't know about Brian Cage, you definitely won't forget about Brian Cage after Fighter Fest. Yeah, all right. Awesome. So yeah, that's all the, you know, AEW, all the wrestling stuff. Let's get some comics and hobbies. I'm pretty sure we have some time. All right. Favorite superhero. So I know this, but I want fans who don't know you. So let's just go through this. Favorite superhero. Wolverine. Obviously. All right. That's the Cyburns, the, the, the Weapon X finish, the, the Weapon X, you know, gear and monikers, the, the, the drill claw. Uh, I do discus Larry as well because the tornado claw. Plenty of Wolverine references in my repertoire. And then just for S and Giggles, my, uh, my second, my runner up is, uh, is Magneto. All right, Magneto. All right, so you're more of the mutants guy. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely an X Men guy over anything else. So you can also, you can, if you're a big fan of the MCU, then you know how much hurts my heart with the X Men movies. I'm very good. <laughs> That's my next question. What's your favorite you know, X Men movie or superhero movie in general? Uh, okay, so. I mean, Avengers, I actually like Infinity War more than Endgame, but I mean, you know, the, both of those are just epic, and the, the you know, the 10 years it took to get there, tremendous. That being said, you take away like, the blockbuster, you know, big money, big explosion, special effects, amazing superhero movie that most superhero movies are, and then you also throw in a dash of my favorite superhero, and I think Logan is so good. Why? Because it's what Wolverine should have been the whole time, Took so long for him to get to that just, you know, mean, gritty, violent, red rod blood, awesome movie that it was. And it was so good because it was so emotional and so raw, but it wasn't a superhero movie. Yeah. It was about an old man who was sick, helping another old man who was sick, and they were just trying to get on a boat and go, you know, go off the grid essentially. So the fact that it was no like, oh, we have to save the world, big explosion, CG, you know, whatever, uh, made it a little more real, you know, and you see, just see more real about it. Um, but I, I loved it. I wish I wish Logan would have been the, the first Wolverine movie, and it could have evolved to what Logan like. Then it would just all of it would have been amazing. Yeah, that would have been my next question because I feel like Logan was the only movie that made you follow a character, no matter how they would have done it. If they started with Logan or ended it with Logan, you followed a character. You watched them love. You watched them, you know, get tortured. You've seen all the stories that was built, and then that was the end. You know. Dude, that was Hugh Jackman's, I believe, last movie, and I believe it's going to be his last movie, and I think that was the perfect way to end uh, the sure. Logan story. And, 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 you know, too, Patrick Stewart, I thought, was amazing in that movie as well. I thought he did a phenomenal acting job, and obviously that he met his end in that movie as well. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot going on in that movie, and it was, I thought it was, I thought artistically, if you will, you know, because a lot of film and cinema, it's all kind of an artsy thing as well. I thought like artistically, that was, like, the best superhero movie. Obviously, Avengers is amazing and the big blockbuster and just, you know, it's awesome. But, uh, you know, like, like, like the Sundance Film Festival, deal, you know, that, that <laughs> work was to Logan for sure. All right. I got to ask, since we're doing the whole movie thing, what about Dark Knight? Where does Dark Knight play for you? 
Uh, Dark Knight for sure is the best Batman movie, along with the original Tim Burton movie. I love that first one. Um, and I, I laughed at it. I'm like, Heath Ledger's going to be the Joker? I'm like, you can't be the Joker. Jack Nicholson killed that role so much. How could you even come close to redoing that role? And the only way to do it was to completely reinvent it. And Ledger did, obviously, an amazing job at it. Um, and uh, uh, it was great. I did not like the third one at all. I, you know, I mean, I don't like the third one in many movies kind of fall short. But um, it, I didn't hate it. I... I, I didn't like the love that it got. Like, to me, it just didn't feel like a Batman movie for a lot of things. It just felt like a really cool action movie. I think actually that third one, my biggest complaint was just Bane. I hated the Bane voice. I hated the alternate character. So I, like, I like Bane a lot as well. I cosplayed at him. I wrestled at him. They should have just made him normal Bane. But anyways, you were not talking about the third one. We're talking about the second. <laughs> so uh, that no, that that was great. That was that was really good. Uh, far and away, DC's best movie. Obviously, like, like I, said, I like both the Batmans. The first Batman was actually the very first, the Tim Burton one, was the very first movie I ever saw in theater. So uh, that one has a special place in my heart as well. All right. Awesome. All right. Favorite cartoon? I bet you watch a lot of them with your daughter. <laughs> um, right now we've been watching a lot of Spongebob as far as with her cartoon-wise. Um, <laughs> but no, the ultimate favorite cartoon is to throw it back again was X-Men Animated Series. Some memories I got Disney Plus. The first thing I watched Disney Plus, I watched every single episode. I even Googled it all because it's, it's not listed in order. Mm -hmm. So I even Googled it to make sure I watched every episode in order like it's supposed to be. Um, but yes, far and away, uh, X Men the Animated Series. Uh, if we're talking anything like not superhero wise for cartoon, mm, what's, what's one that I really liked? Uh, I mean, there's so many, but. Um, <laughs> I think one thing of is all like superhero. That's super, that's superhero, that's superhero. Um, you know, Animaniacs. Animaniacs are really good as far as cartoons. Yeah, that's a pretty good one. All right. So the next question is, you know, I don't want to ask what your favorite TV shows because I know you don't watch TV a lot. I know that you got to watch TV during the quarantine, but I don't think you watch TV that much, right? I I really don't. Between, so here's the thing too, like I, I took a few weeks off, which is rare, um, around the holidays. So I was home for a few weeks. I left for one week, I got injured. So I was home for like a couple months. And then on top of being home for a couple months, then the pandemic happened. So, like, yeah, I was I was home more over the last, like, six months than I think I have in my entire life. <laughs> uh, so I was I was watching a lot of shows. Um, as far as my favorite TV show, uh, I don't watch a lot of TV, but, like, two shows in the top of my head. One was uh, the first show in, since I was you know, a teenager that caught my attention that super hooked me was Dexter. Nice. I absolutely loved all of Dexter. And then um, uh, because... The only thing outside of like wrestling or Marvel that uh, I can talk about for days is uh, is Army of Darkness. Anything Evil Dead or Army of Darkness. Mm -hmm. So the Ash versus Evil Dead series, I love. And I've already seen it all, but I, I binge watched all three seasons again on Netflix while being you know stuck at home as well. So and uh, that still rings right up there. I love I, everything Bruce Campbell does is gold. So he gets a pass no matter what he does. All right, awesome. All right, are you a gamer? Would you say you play your fair share of games? Yeah, I, I'm not. Um, I'm not a big gamer anymore. As far as like you know, gaming and everything, I do I enjoy video games where I play them. Yes, I used to obviously play them a tremendously amount, <laughs> but I, I'm I'm not so much anymore. I'm more of a of a selective or, or part time gamer, I guess. So there's only so many different games that I can really get into. I want to play, and I'll play a lot of games for like you know just just a little bit, and then and then I won't touch them probably for a while. I was just playing God of War. Um, on PS4, um, I beat, uh, actually I beat several games, uh, again with the whole pandemic deal. Um, uh, but my favorite, uh, my favorite game series is Resident Evil and, uh, and the Uncharted series. Those are probably my two favorite series. Uh, you know, it just started, it's going to be a sequel with Last of Us, which is also the same people made Uncharted. Last of Us, you can't go wrong with you. That, 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 that game is incredible. So I have to ask, because, you know, you said you cosplayed as Bane. Will we ever see a cosplay as Kratos? Anything, you know, to that extent? The face paint? Um, you know what? Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm lazy. I'm really lazy <laughs> when it comes to being a creative level <laughs> death department. So, like, if, if, if there's a way for me to be Kratos, I absolutely would be it. But I would, like, someone would have to make me Kratos as opposed <laughs> to me making myself Kratos. If that, if that was there, then sure, absolutely I'd do it. I think it'd be rad. It'd be super awesome because I love all that. I just... I am not uh, artistic or creative enough to make cool costumes. And even like the, the Bane one I got made, I mean, I had the mask, but the Venom contraption thing I got was, was from a friend. 
same person who made like my uh, my Terminator entrance attire, my Weapon X entrance attire. Uh, and he does a lot of cosplay, a lot of like power con stuff for He Man. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's so many people I'd love to cosplay as or, or wrestle as or whatever. But uh, yeah, if somebody's offering to help, you know, create that image, absolutely sign them up. Let's do it. All right. Tell us a few of your hobbies. What do you like to do when you're not wrestling? Um, uh, if I'm not wrestling and I'm not working out, um, I mean, those are pretty much I spend most of the time. Uh, I'm a big, 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 big fan of movies, just movies in general. Uh, I, I said I don't watch a lot of TV. I watch a lot of movies, uh, mainly because I want to start middle names. Like, <laughs> if I go to watch a TV show that every raves about, and there's like, you know, six seasons and like 15 episodes, but I'm like, I'm never going to finish this. <laughs> um, uh, I, I am still just as fan. I don't do it as much. I still can do some tricks, uh, but I'm a huge fan of skateboarding. Uh, except with the way that I'm a huge fan of bodybuilding, a huge fan of comics. Um, I like a lot of small animals. I, I, mean, I have a couple dogs. I love dogs too, but I'm, I had a couple hedgehogs and a uh, chameleon. Um, so I like little animals. I have a, a, a crested gecko right now. So I have played those. Um, obviously, uh, uh, I have, I have two, my son is 14, graduates junior high tomorrow, actually. Oh, um, so being able to partake in activities with them. Uh, I, I'm a big kid. I'm a big dork. It's funny because I come across as a big, mean, you know, me headed, you know, hard ass on TV and, and wrestling. But in real life, I'm really just as a big dork. I mean, it's fun to uh, partake in all my kid activities with my kids because most people of my age are, are an adult now. And I, I tend not to be. So it's, it's fun. Great way to uh, and then back to the cruise too, I get really excited about food, man. I get really excited about food. When there's like a cheat day or like a fun meal time or buffet happening, I get pretty excited. So, how how is the catering in AEW? You know what? The catering hasn't been that great because of the pandemic. So what they have is limited as far as uh, selection and whatnot. Um, but that being said, they have uh, they have food for us at like almost every event and every show and every you know thing at the back of the hotel as well. And that has been top notch. Top notch, top notch, top notch. So, right. uh, I mean, just, just uh, again, to throw back to AW2, the overall treatment, you know, before, during, and after everything that I've been a part of so far has been has been incredible. So, they really take care of their talent there, for sure. All right. Well, I know I know you did an interview because of Van Vliet, and I know you talked about, you know, bringing your own chicken with you with your suitcase, and is that, what you're, is that what you're still doing in AEW when the catering isn't I, that great? I, I, I do still. I still brought my own food for a couple of days when I'm out there. Uh, I found a meal prep place as well. Because see, here's the thing: one, I can't always count on on them having like the the food as far as like the clean food mm-hmm. um, that I need to eat, and not only the clean food, but also the amount of the clean food that I need to eat. So, um, and whenever I do that, and I roll the dice, I usually regret it. So, uh, like, there's a lot of times on the catering I didn't even get it. I'll just get like some things because um, it's just stuff that uh, either a isn't that healthy or just doesn't fit my diet or even more so doesn't fit in like what I want to eat right before I wrestle, you know? So, um, I, I would eat some of it or eat some of it after the match or whatever, but no, I would, I stocked up on some stuff on the way out there that I made. And then, uh, the first day there, I, I got a bunch of meal prep and then a few days later I got some more. So between that and, uh, and the food that they'd have for us, you know, at certain events and stuff and, and at the hotel post show and whatnot, I was able to, uh, to hit all my macros, if you will. But yeah, no, I always have the six-pack back with me. Fuller <laughs> always goes with me, every day. All right, awesome. So we're getting down to the few final questions. I want to talk about merchandise. You know, I'm a big figure collector. I love action figures. Is there anything planned, or was there anything planned, like, of creating a Brian Cage figure? Um, I know when I did my photos, they took action figure photos, and I would I would assume they're going to make Brian Cage figures because I look like an action figure, <laughs> so I should be an action figure, damn it. Um, but there's... There's plenty of awesome custom ones. Um, uh, a guy DWO Customs who just made a, a sweet Canyon Mortis um, like combination figure for me uh, is in the process of making one. And then Mad Reaper Studios has made an awesome Lucha Underground Brian Cage. But I know there's several custom Brian Cage figures. Um, but yes, I, I would imagine there's one coming. And <laughs> I'm a huge action figure collector as well, so I would uh, I would I would be thrilled to have it. Awesome. All right. So, you know, I want to know now that, you know, AW just announced their own toy line. How do you, have you, I know you've 
But have you ever held their figures? Have you held their first designs or not? Uh, no, you have not. Haven't. Okay. So do you have you seen like the articulation wise? Like have you seen the commercial and stuff yeah, like that? I saw like, they first brought them out too. Like you had like you know Kenny and, and Hangman and everybody like turning out their figures and their entrance stuff. Like you know they look they look really good quality. You know that like I'm not jinxing it, but you know that if you do beat Mox, your figure is gonna come faster than probably anyone else's. No, yeah, I would imagine. I would imagine. <laughs> I would imagine. I know. I know they got some cage keys coming soon too. So hopefully it all just starts popping out at once. All right, awesome. All right, so down to our last question. Now, I just want to. I just want to know. You know what you what you have planned for the future in the way. And like you are doing AW, but are you doing any side projects? You know, have you have you decided to take up some other projects other than you know wrestling? Um, you know the, the opportunity is always there. Um, I've always had some uh, <sighs> some aspirations for uh, for other passions in my life. You know, but like fitness wise, you know, whether that be a supplement line, fitness line, clothing line, gym, or whatever. Um, I've always had a bunch of different little ideas and stuff I'd like to get to, and I felt like I've always been waiting on it. Um, not only uh, financially, but more so to have like the namesake value of it behind it to help it uh, succeed and excel. Um, that being said, though, uh, but right after actually the double or nothing in pay per too, I was contacted by, uh, uh, by different affiliates from different, you know, sports entertainment or products and sponsorship wise stuff. So that kind of helped get the ball rolling right away, um, especially again coming back from injury, kind of sitting on the sidelines. So, yes, yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully some things will, uh, will get shaken and, and, and be happening by, uh, by the end of summer. All right. All right. Awesome. Cool. Uh, tell us where, you know, people that are listening to this can find you on social media. Uh, so we got Brian Cage on Instagram, Mr. GMSI. It's pretty much to present. No, that, that stands for get my shit in. But Mr. GMSI underscore B Cage on Twitter. It's, uh, it's not the best name. I kind of regret making that name like that. But I have a blue check mark. So we change it, at least, so I'll deal with it. Um, and then you can get, uh, until AEW releases my, my stuff, um, as of right now, you can still get my, uh, my Brian Cage uh, t-shirts off of Pro and Tees at Pro and Tees backslash Brian Cage. All right, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time. Wow, what an awesome listen. That was by far one of my favorite interviews I have ever done. And by far, in my opinion, the best Brian Cage interview that has ever been done. I got everything from Impact Wrestling to Lucha Underground to WWE, Fighter Fest, Double or Nothing, his rivalry with John Moxley. Everything was answered just now in that interview. And if you have more questions, well, I'll have them again sometime in the future. But uh, remember the main point, and the main point is, who will stop? The path of Cage. Will it be John Moxie? We will have to see. See you guys next time. And please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share. And again, if you guys love me in any way and you support me in any way, all my information is in the bio below. We will have big things coming. Like I said, the bigger things are coming. And maybe something a little bit different than an interview. We will see. I will see you guys next time. Thank you for being awesome.